Here we go. I believe it's the sixth episode of ABT Time podcast. We're really up to six already, Randy. That went fast. I know. It's just screaming by. Next thing you know, we'll be at seven. Um, and as <laughs> if we, we all... make it that far, if we get that far. <laughs> right, before we get canceled. Uh, and as we know, it is afternoon tea time in California and morning tea time in Melbourne, Australia. Good morning, Jen. How are you doing? Good morning, Randy. Oh, look, I'm mighty fine. We got an incredibly good view of the lunar eclipse here in Melbourne last night. It was completely clear sky. Uh, My kids and I were just standing out on our back deck and it was just stunning. So I'm feeling very sciencey this morning because it was just beautiful. This gorgeous red moon. It was, yeah, amazing stuff. I read about it. I did not see it last night. Um, What's the weather like? What time of year you got down there? Well, we're heading into winter. So, I mean, we've had on the weekend, we had this beautiful autumn weather. So Melbourne in autumn, if you've never spent any time in autumn in Melbourne, you need to come because we have these beautiful, sunny, clear, crisp days. So yeah, my son and I did a massive bike ride on the weekend in the sunshine and it was delightful. But today it's kind of more typical Melbourne winter weather, kind of grey, kind of drizzly, kind of cold. I'm happy to have my warm cup of tea. And And, uh, yeah, we've... You're in the middle of classes with university right now? That's the last week. I've made it to week 12 of semester. So my last lecture for the semester is later on today. So all the staff and students are just completely exhausted. And uh, yeah, we've also got our first COVID cases for a while. So I don't know how much people in the US have heard, but we went for a total elimination strategy and we've had zero COVID in the community for many, many months now, but we've got a new little outbreak. So I'm sitting on tenterhooks waiting to hear if we're going to be going back into lockdown today because our government standard response is a hard lockdown, which is meant to be short, but last year we ended up spending most of eight months in lockdown. So if you see my face fall, it's because I will have got a text message from someone saying lockdown it is. (laughs) <laughs> and we're still moving along at 30,000 cases a day here and seeing yeah, that. As, I mean, yeah, they equate that to, to zero in, in the United States. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just so different, right? There's been a lot of noise on Twitter this week about why the hell do people in Australia get so upset about a few cases? And I get that, right? I totally get that. For most of the world, we are in the most enviable, enviable position ever. But if you've gone for an elimination strategy, which we could argue about for hours, but the point is that's what's been decided. A few cases that becomes a lot of cases because, you know, we've got these hotspots now. We know someone who since tested positive was at a footy match last weekend. You know, you have a couple of super spreader events and it's all out of hand again. So different people have tried different approaches, right? We all have our different politics. Um, I was always a fan of Australia when it comes to science. And in my field of marine biology and coral reef ecology, um, you guys set an example for the world with what you did for the Great Barrier Reef. You had a single institution you built there, the Australian Institute of Marine Science in Townsville. You had a single overarching plan on how to study the Great Barrier Reef. And for years, people in presentations at big science meetings, things like that, have talked, pointed to Australia as the model for how to systematically singular, you know, I mean, it just matches all my intuition for Mm -hmm. the singular narrative and and leadership. The idea that the the country came together and put together a coherent plan that did a great job of studying that giant resource. You'd look at the Caribbean and what the U S has done. Everything is so piecemeal here in this country and they're proud of how competitive it is, but the amount of redundancy and people doing the same thing in different labs and inefficiency, yada, yada, all my years as a scientist, that's part of what drew me to Australia and work there. I just, I absolutely love that setup with, uh, with mm-hmm. Ames and all that went with it. Um, there's a downside of it. There's a lot of inefficiency that sometimes <laughs> goes with <laughs> that kind of yeah, <laughs> singularity, but we won't get into that. Yeah. Um, what we will get into is today's big agenda. And Woo-hoo! today's episode is titled Fun with Brian Palermo. Um, that's That's a lot of pressure on brian i mean Uh, if if the whole episode is based on him being fun that's a lot of pressure uh, the guy is he's a performer and he's an improv (laughs) performer and a comic actor he'd better be fun and if not bring it on (laughs) we'll let him know it and before we do bring him on we're going to have a lengthy introduction from me because i I think the world of the guy i've been working with him for more than 10 years so i've got to tell the entire detailed history of where I met him, where it all started from. Before we dive into that, let's say a few little uh, previews of coming attractions. 
So Ooh, yes, please. Yeehaw. Um, well, you're not going to be a part of next week's episode. I regret to inform you. So yeah, I know. Well, I'll be doing something just as fun. I'll be teaching about a hundred women in STEM from all over the world. Um, wow. Sadly online rather than face to face, but I'll, I'll miss you, huh. Randy. I really will. And, and what will that lecture be about? So this is a pro program called Homeward Bound, which I don't know uh, if any of our listeners have heard of, but it's, a, it's an Australian, originally an Australian program, but it's now absolutely global. And it's to train women with a background in STEM M, uh, so including medicine, to be more visible and more effective leaders with, a, with an idea that it's people with a background in STEM who have the chance to, to try and make our world a bit more sustainable. So I'm part of the teaching faculty for that program and uh, the, my area is visibility. So training women in how to be more visible leaders, essentially. So some of that's around being, you know, knowing yourself and your strengths and your weaknesses, but also how we can go out and be more visible to the people around us who we need to be able to influence, essentially. Um, and it's through this program that I've been fortunate enough to go to Antarctica. So it's... Um, oh, where, where'd you go there? To be ...involved with. Uh, in late 2019, so Homeward Bound is a program where you have essentially 11 months of online teaching, mm. and then uh, the program culminates in a really intensive immersive program in Antarctica for a month where we actually get to be face to face with everybody so clearly at the moment that's not happening and we don't know when that will be allowed to happen again but not long before COVID hit I was lucky enough to spend a month in Antarctica with yeah 100 women from all around the world being immersed in this world of how can and we make a difference where were you at McMurdo or Palmer or where no, no, we were traveling the whole time. So we left from oh. Ushuaia and we traveled around the Antarctic Peninsula and got to do lots of landings and lots of learning about the future of Antarctica and what's going on there. So, so you were on a great big pretty ship. Incredible. Sure was. Hmm. Uh, how well, was not that big a ship. There was only about 110 of us, 120 passengers, I think. So not, not one of those massive ships full of. And how was your passage through the Drake? Uh, we got Drake Lake, no Drake Shake for us. We had oh both God. directions. We had a really calm crossing both ways, which was pretty, wow. pretty fortunate. Yeah, Turns out I don't get seasick either way, but um, even those women who did get seasick, it wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been. So, Wow. I didn't early on in my career, but by the end of it, I had a few trips that <laughs> were just horrifyingly <laughs> bad. Um, one in particular to the north end of England, around the top of England, there was uh, a lot of rough seas, but um, let's see, let's get back to work here. So previews of coming yes. attractions, what you're going to be missing out on, sad to say, is next Wednesday we'll be um, airing or posting discussion that I'm actually going to have on Sunday with two of my film school classmates, Greg oh, cool. Tillman and Jason Ensler, who both are very successful, prominent filmmakers in Hollywood these days. Um, Greg is executive producer and editor of lots of big shows, including Night Stalker, which was the number one show on Netflix back in, I think, February or so, and mm -hmm. lots of documentaries. Um, Jason Ensler is director of lots of big TV series, and um, he's got a pilot right now that he's in the middle of directing. So we have been buddies for 26 or 27 years, and we're going to tell a lot of war stories. It's going to be a huge amount of fun. We'll do that on Sunday afternoon, record it, and then post it next Wednesday. Um, the following week... We're going to do something. Oh, you know what? The following week. We're, we're, <laughs> I hope we're doing something. Well, you know what? It'll be your return back. And that day will be June 9th. Um, that's the day we're doing our narrative blitz redux, the rerun and the narrative blitz. So yep. I figured since we're doing that, um, we should just spend the, um, the podcast time. Uh, doing kind of a post-mortem of the whole thing. Um, and yep. you, you thought you might be able to get up at 4 a.m. to watch it? Um, yeah, I've yeah. booked in and paid my money. I'm not going to miss out. So if you see me <laughs> nodding off, if you right. see me nodding off by 8 a.m., just yeah, you know, throw, you throw virtual things at me to keep me awake. No, I can't oh, wait. Excellent. I promise it will deliver. So we'll just take that session for you and me to chit-chat. We might have one or two of the, the folks in it on as guests as well. I mean, that's the great thing with this course. We've got about 15 people with the course, including Brian Palermo, who are just kind of our standby guests at any given time if we should ever run out of ideas. Um, as we clearly so when, have today. <laughs> so when we decide that we're far too boring and nobody's tuning in, tuning in anymore, we'll just bring in cooler people than us, right? That's pretty much the case for today, yeah. precisely. Perfect. Um, and then let's see, then the week after that is when we're going to do our teaching special. Yes. So yes, Liz Peterson from 
the round of the course that just finished from Ecological Society of America, wrote me a great email last week uh, asking some questions about how do we use the ABT in teaching. And as I read that, I thought, you know, Jen's kind of a world expert on that topic. And then <laughs> self-appointed world expert. <laughs> well, the field is not that large as yet. So <laughs> I'm, I'm first out. out of I'm first out of one. It's a pretty that's, cool place that's to kind be. Of, now there, there's a few more. Um, <laughs> and let's see. And actually, Keisha Barr, I haven't gotten in touch with her, but I'll see. It. She gives one of the talks in the Blitz and she has um, been using the ABT for a year or two there at Texas A&M. So I'll see if she can join us as well. And, um, and who knows who else, but we'll have a kind of a group discussion. That'll be a really good, fun, special. Yeah, so I guess right. a couple of weeks to get ready for that and think through what we want to uh, talk about exactly with it. Um, and then, oh, and wait a second. Actually, that one's going to have to wait until 23rd because on June 16th, we're going to have my two friends, That's Jennifer right. Jacquet and John Hosabar, who are both major experts on the subject of overfishing. And we're mm -hmm. going to talk about the documentary Sea Spiracy and all kinds of things Excellent. like that. So that will be a Can't lot of wait. fun. All right. That's all our previews of coming attractions. It's time to get on with the show here and start talking about our wonderful guest. Um, and on that note, let me share these slides that will cue me for what I have to say about our friend Palermo. And I'm all ears. Okay. Hopefully we're looking good. Are you seeing the picture there of his name? Yep. Um, Good old Brian Palermo. So the introduction, this is an introduction I usually give in the course for him, but with a few more bits and pieces added, in fact, a little bit more substance. And uh, hopefully he's listening in uh, at this point. And this all kind of begins with 2009. Right before I met him, I published my first book, Don't Be Such a Scientist. And that book opens with this legendary one paragraph from the first night of my acting course, the crazy acting teacher from the Meisner Technique as she screamed her head off at me saying, you think too much, you mother effing think too much, you're nothing but an arrogant pointy headed intellectual, I want you out of my classroom and off the premises in five minutes or I'm calling the police and having you arrested for trespassing and I'm not effing joking, you a-hole. So <laughs> that is the dispassionate version of her screaming and yelling all this at me verbatim that night in front of 25 little um, early 20s kids screaming and howling with laughter at me, the professor dude being told off by the acting teacher. It took me 15 years to process what went on that night and make sense out of it. Um, I hung in there in the course and it turned out to be a tremendous life altering course. And I did eventually understand what she was saying, which is that um, academics don't listen. And there's the core problem. And it comes up over and over and over again. I talked about it a bit in the book. Uh, however, when the book came out in 2009, it got nice reviews. And this was one that was written in science by Peter Kariba, who was the chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy at the time. And he said, nice book. However, it failed to hit on the most, uh, the biggest problem that scientists have when it comes to communication. He said, the failure of scientists as communicators is that they do not know how to listen. So I couldn't agree more. That is absolutely the truth. Um, as a result, when I did the second edition of the book, I added a chapter in 2018. Second edition has a new chapter in there, don't be such a poor listener. And it is the bane of scientists, their inability to listen, of academics in general. Academics are hired to lecture, not to listen. They are not professional listeners, so they have a challenge with this. Um, the, in that acting class, at the core of it was this idea of listening, because that's what acting involves. You, you can't be a good actor if you don't know how to listen, if you're not listening. And in theatrical acting, what the audience is looking for, they, they always say acting is reacting. We don't want to hear your lecture to us. We want to watch you react to what's going on around you. That's where it gets really interesting. So we learned a bit about that in my Meisner training. And then I began taking a few improv courses as well. And it's the same thing in improv, even more so, because what improv is built around is this idea of putting the focus on your partner, not yourself. You don't sit there and worry about how you're doing. You're studying your partner and always trying to make your partner look as good as possible. And the, the kind of uh, counterintuitive thing that ends up happening is that the more you're working on making your partner look good, the better you look good as a result of that. So the ultimate showcase for improv in Hollywood is the Groundlings Theater um, on Melrose Avenue. It's legendary and it goes all the way back I think, to the 1970s. It's one of the two main kind of feeding grounds for the cast of Saturday Night Live and all the great comic actors in the United States. Um, long history of people like Will Ferrell and, and Phil Hartman, Pee Wee Herman and Kristen Wiig and on and on and on. All these great comic actors that have come from there, Melissa McCarthy in particular, 
um, who ended up doing, I did a short film with her back in the ocean conservation days. So I began doing films and casting um, the groundlings in my films starting in 2002. And out of that developed a partnership with a great guy, Jeremy Rowley, who helped me with my shifting baselines project. And by about 2009, 10, I'd cast probably about 20 groundlings in different films that I'd done. And all the while I was dreaming and hoping that someday <clears throat> I might find one of them who was not only a great comic actor, great actor, but would also have a little bit of a kind of intellectual interest in my mission, which was to try and work on science communication. And I finally found it. I found it in uh, this guy, Brian Palermo, who is a great actor, is in lots of TV shows over the years. He was a recurring cast member on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno and lots of other shows. And then had this part in a great movie, The Social Network, you know, the story of Mark Zuckerberg. So we'll play this. Hopefully people listening can at least hear the audio of this scene. And Matt, let me know if there's any technical problems with this, but hopefully this will play fine. This is a scene where Brian plays, of all things, a computer science professor. And here we go. Okay, let's look at a sample problem. Suppose we're given a computer with a 16-bit virtual address and a page size of 256 bytes. The system uses one-level page tables that start at address hex 400. Maybe you want DMA on your 16-bit system. Who knows? The first few pages are reserved for hardware flags, etc. Assume page table entries have eight status bits. The eight status bits would then be... Anybody? Ah, and I see we have our first surrender. Don't worry, Mr. Zuckerberg. Brighter men than you have tried and failed this class. One valid bit, one modified bit, one reference bit, five permission bits. That is correct. Does everybody see how he got there? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's such a great scene. And, you know, it's not coincidence that uh, uh, Brian's got a little bit of a technical mind. And I think that probably helped him be so con convincing as a uh, computer science professor there. You know, he's completely yeah, who Who wouldn't have known that he was a total computer geek in that scene? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> he is such a good actor. So based on that, I cast him in, I'm not based on that, but in general, I, I cast him in one short film I was doing. And during that film, he started asking me, um, you know, what is this stuff that you're doing? Why, why did you leave your career as a marine biologist? And, you know, I'm really, I'd, he asked, would you like to go have lunch? I'd really like to hear more about what it is you're doing. Bingo, that was it. Like, I, there's my guy finally that really had the deeper interest in this stuff. So ended up by 2010, put together a, a workshop, but people began asking me to come do workshops based on my book. And I wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted to do. So my first instinct was to recruit a couple of actors, both he and a friend of mine, Dory Barton. And we put together a workshop called the Storymaker, uh, Connection Storymaker Workshop, which we did for about three years. But this was the very first time I ever worked with him where he did improv. And this was the, with a group of ocean conservation folks. And I was standing to the side taking photos of this because I was in shock. The energy that this guy brought in, I'd already had six or seven groundlings do workshops with me and they were all pretty good. And then all of a sudden this like nuclear particle comes into the room and starts <laughs> screaming and dancing around and yelling at people. And, and you see the energy transfers from him into these people. And suddenly they're all acting, you know, with a whole lot more energy than they, they had. Um, he brings so much energy to it. That was one that we did with the ocean folks. This is um, one we did it with LSU and we ended up doing a lot of different places. Uh, what we would generally do is split the, the day into he doing improv and me doing narrative stuff worked really, really well. And then this is Dory Barton also. And we were kind of a team. We had one, uh, we had a bunch of, of, of great visits. One of them was to the Monterey Bay Aquarium where this photo was taken from in our prime. And then eventually we went on to write this book in which we kind of split it up. I wrote the first half of the book and then each of them took um, one, one quarter each. And it was great. And it got great reviews. It's on Amazon. Um, so a couple last little things I want to toss out here to kind of lay the groundwork for Brian. This is stuff for us to be talking about in depth because I wanted to be more than just kind of ambling around. But um, Brian, hopefully you're listening at this point. And so this is, we did our workshop with the National Park Service in Fort Collins and my buddy Kurt Fristrup brought us in. A couple of years later, I talked to him and I, I sort of asked, you know, did, how much of an impact do you think we had with doing that workshop? Um, did anything, especially the improv stuff, did that make any impact? Oops. And he said, um, you know, oh my goodness, yes, did it ever. And so this is what I had written down in a blog post where I, I talked about that. Um, I said, I had a long phone call with, with Kurt, one of our hosts. Uh, he said, you wouldn't believe how many times in discussions since that training, we have brought up the basic yes and approach you taught us in the workshop. 
There have been multiple instances where everyone is headed in a negative direction. Then someone says, let's remember the yes and thing. And the discussion reverses almost immediately. Mm-hmm. That, that was can amazing. When he that. Told, what's that? I can imagine exactly how that would happen. Yeah. And same with me. And when he told me that, because, you know, having been a scientist, scientists have a bad habit sometimes of mm-hmm. getting together into a feeding frenzy. And I witnessed this with dissertation. Um, you know, I was on several dis- dissertation committees where the poor student would be sitting there and three or four scientists are trying to one up each other and being more critical of this poor student's work. And next thing you know, it's all headed in this downward spiral, tearing it all to pieces and eventually taking the whole thing into pieces and handing it back to them. Say, here, you know, look, here's your idea. We've, we've wrecked it for you. Um, they can get going in such a negative direction. And that's exactly what this is about. And the same with committee meetings, you know, can just rip an idea to pieces. And this is really a functional dimension of improv in, in the real world, how it can be valuable, which I thought was really cool. Um, we're going to have Brian talk about his crazy Uncle Joe show. Um, in fact, I'll skip the whole history of that because there's a lot to tell about that. But this is the other last little introductory thing I want to share, which is um, this is from to, uh, 2013. So eight years ago, uh, this woman, Vicki Miller, contacted me and she was a molecular biologist, I think, um, in in Scotland, I believe. Um, and she had read the section of my book about improv and that had helped inspire her to actually go and take an improv course. And so just want to read some of what I had in this. I did a blog post. This is when I had my blog, The Benchy. And I, I thought I, I had a phone call with her in which we talked in, in great detail. And it was so cool, the stories that she told. So here's what she said. Um, and well, this is my blog post, me telling about it. Um, uh, quote, hi, I'm Vicky and I'm a scientist. Um, that's how she started her class in January. The whole process actually began three years ago when she got married. She and her husband memorized their vows, but when it came time to perform them, her husband, a university lecturer, who's also an actor singer with a booming voice, projected his words throughout the room. But she spoke up with her mousy voice and could hardly be heard. The same was true when she would give science talks until finally last May, her friend Jane Oakshot, <clears throat> who teaches voice classes at Leeds University, convinced her to take three one hour classes with her. That was the start of the transition. Uh, quote, people would say, speak up, but without technique, you're just shouting, not projecting. In the voice classes, they did a few improv exercises. Uh, and these are quotes from her. Uh, quote, she made me do exercises, pretending to talk to a dog at first, um, and then talk to a friend using the same words, but to see how your voice changes depending upon the relationship. I couldn't do it. It felt too silly. It was really hard. Um, but now talking about her, Vicky. Um, but when Vicky read my book over this past Christmas, read the things I said about improv training, she made up her mind to address this challenge. In typical scientist form, straight out of my book, she began researching the matter, reading several books on improv, but she finally realized the only way you can really get to know improv, the ultimate experiential technique is alas to experience it. Um, so this is from her uh, quote. She said, the thing I find about improv is it gives you a contact high. My whole class began complaining that we would finish the class at 10 p.m. Nobody could get to sleep until 3 a.m., all thinking about the ways we could do it much better. Uh, quote, we did a scene with objectives. I was given the role of being the most important person in the room. Instead of being quiet and reclusive, my normal self, it was so much fun to try that sort of thing in a place where there were no consequences. Actually, I'm just back from a science conference. Normally, I would talk to two or three people but because of this training, I probably talked to about 50 people able to relax and exchange ideas, all because of what I've gained through the improv class. On uh, the last little bit here, she said, uh, quote, we recently had a very big departmental seminar with a very important speaker. I asked a question which I would never have done before because I wouldn't have been sure I would have been heard. There are so many more possibilities, not scared, not hunched down, not wanting to destroy others uh, to make myself look good. I can play with them now. So, <laughs> you know, so great. Isn't that, isn't that I can wonderful? I picture her in my mind, the, the mousy, quiet chemist who's yeah. just always been in the background and now kind of owns, owns who she is and what she can offer. Exactly. And the idea that it began at her wedding, that her mm. husband with the booming voice <laughs> performed the room and she sat there and nobody could hear her. And that, that upset mm. her so much that, she, much that she went and got the improv prop training. Um, okay. So Brian, you want to join us there? That was just a little bit of background that hopefully you can draw <laughs> on. Yeah. There, there is the beardless Palermo. The beardless <laughs> Palermo. That's my nickname. That's my fighting nickname now. <laughs> Um, Shall I just and, call you Beardless? Nice to meet you, Beardless. I'm Jen. Very, very nice to meet you as well, Jen. And I notice you have no beard as well. 
<laughs> no, oh. I lost it somewhere along the way. I'll have to try and find it again. <laughs> um, and, and Jen, we had Brian in your round of the course, didn't we? Last year? Yes, yes, certainly did. So uh, it's, it's not a first meeting for me, but probably for you, because there was a lot of people in that course. <laughs> but was his appearance life altering for you? Uh, well, it was four o'clock in the morning, up. so I don't know if I would say it was life altering, but I certainly do remember your presence. Is that is that good enough? I'll take it. Yes, that's a positive. <laughs> you remembered, well, hopefully positively. We'll, we'll see. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to lie. I'm happy to lie and make something up, Randy, but I think that would undermine the quality of what we're trying to do here. So would. I'd rather you be authentic uh, than to lie. Exactly. That's a good yeah, idea. Yeah, no, absolutely. I... I yeah, I, can go around. I was just going to say, say, I definitely remember. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's the bee's knees, as you people would say. Um, and <laughs> I can authentically say that um, you are shockingly 20 years younger looking without that, right? that COVID beard. That you, That's you what I, I, just, I grew the beard for the year for, for COVID, just as a lark kind of thing. But I didn't, I didn't, uh, <laughs> I don't have much of an aesthetic, but I didn't like the way it looked. So I said, I'm going back to the, the smooth skin. We'll just see. <laughs> I do think I look a little bit younger. That's amazing. Um, tell us what you're up to lately before we get diving into the hardcore substance. What have you been, what have you been doing? Uh, well, we're moving up to Washington State in the summer. So we've just been busy getting this house ready. To, they're, they're literally moving boxes in my corner. Uh, getting this house ready to, to, to rent or sell or whatever and get the kids switched to the other school and blah, 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 blah. So very, very busy with all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I cured COVID. I, my, I buried the lead there, you know, but I fixed that. Um, <laughs> Well done. Awesome. Can you can you pop over? Because there's a few other places in the world that might need your help, I think. Absolutely <laughs> can. Absolutely can. It's going to cost you something. Uh, <laughs> but then been teaching a lot online and I teach, uh, we might get into it or not, but I teach still the comedy theatrical improv and then I teach in a corporate mm -hmm. sphere. And then through you, my buddy, Randy Olson, uh, I have taught with science communicators for 10 years now. And uh, now I have a couple of ongoing contracts with National Park Service, which I, I adore. I'm so happy because I actually love. Oh, okay, wait, wait a second. On that note, tell us about your um, community of practice idea you just mentioned to me. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, this is something that's come up every once in a while. I'll do a workshop and people uh, generally I get very positive feedback. It's like, oh, this is great. But I know that if I don't practice it, it's just going to go away by tomorrow. So I often suggest that people form a community of practice and as casual as, you know, once one lunch per month or just it's just something realistic. And uh, the NPS, National Park Service, liked that suggestion. So we made it happen. They, they hired me to come do it. So now once a month, uh, we'll meet. And right now it's still virtual. But that way, people who have taken the class can just come in for an hour or so and uh, get a little exercise. It's, it's the narrative gym, like your, your thing. It's just you got to yeah. work it out. you got to experience. you got to keep doing it. So that is a community of practice that will now be ongoing. And really, they don't need me uh, to lead it. There's a few very basic exercises that anyone could do. But it's the accountability, I think. of like, oh, we've got this outside uh, trainer guy. I'm a facilitator guy. We get this outside facilitator guy coming in. Let's go do that one hour. So it's been, it's been great. And hopefully, we'll just continue doing them. And are you guys getting back to being live and in person, person at the Groundlings? I just saw an email an hour ago with that good news. They're going to come back mid-July. Uh, somehow they, they, they intend to uh, enforce an all-vaccinated audience. So I, I don't know if they're going to be checking people's actual uh, certificates or whatnot. But that's the idea, to come back for an audience in mid-July. And then the school will restart up in August. So the school also had been uh, devastated by the fact that we could, it's all in person, obviously. So um, that'll come back in August. So that's excellent news on the, the side of the groundlings. And that certainly will affect me as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what about the Joe show? Are you going to go back to live with that? Joe show will go back live. I think we'll, I think I'll get one more in before I, I take off here. I'm so excited. By so what that is, Jen, is uh, the, the crazy uncle okay, Joe. Okay, okay, wait, wait, hang, hang on, hang on. Well, tell, <laughs> you set me up and then you shut me down. No, 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 no. <laughs> take, us, take us to the start. Tell us about the birth of the Joe show. Oh, good Lord. I, uh, okay, so uh, my friend Holly Mandel, who's another grounding alumni, uh, she had been taking classes with other theaters around town, as we all do, as you, you should, you get, you know, sort of uh, professional development all over the place to, to make that analogy. And she had learned this sort of a uh, clap edit thing. So you're doing a scene, someone claps, and that starts a new scene and you just do it again yeah. endlessly. Um, so at the time, the Groundlings did not have any sort of long form. We just did short form improv, which is 
just that short. Randy and Jen are in a donut shop and what happens? Two minute scene, it's over. Next, long for me. Randy ate all the donuts. So that was the okay. end. Excellent, Jen. <laughs> Excellent. But it wouldn't end there. You, you add to it. So Randy ate all the donuts and he had a coronary and you had to save his life. And as a result, he gave you uh, the inheritance and you, you now own the donut shop. Whatever. Oh, no, I know. So, I thought I was going to fight him to get some of the donuts back. We could do <laughs> that too. But my at donuts. that point, at that, at that point, they're regurgitated donuts in the fiction. Oh, hey, okay. He can have it. He can have it and he can have the coronary and I'll have the or, inheritance. Thanks, Randy. <laughs> or the regurgitated donuts work if you evolve into some sort of seabird. So that's yeah. possible too. Improv, it's all fiction, dude. All right, so Holly thought of this idea. Let's do a groundling show with the long form clap entity thing, uh, which she had learned from a guy named Stan Wells. And she put together a cast of myself, Roy Jenkins, uh, uh, Ted Michaels, Jordan Black, Kristen Susson, and shortly thereafter, Stephanie Courtney, who is Flo, the progressive girl. I don't know if she's in Australia as well, uh, Jen. but um, Maybe, anyway, but I don't know, sorry. Well, it's, it, you would have seen it. It's, it's yeah. ubiquitous and annoyingly ubiquitous. Uh, so she, <laughs> she joined us shortly thereafter, the beginning of it. And we've been doing that show every Wednesday night now for what will be 20 years. July will be 20 years. 20 so, years. Wow. 20 years. So do the math. And that is literally 1,000 Uncle Joe shows. Uh, that, and I've probably done 95% of them personally. So I, I, I'm going to claim that I've done 1,000 of, of that particular format. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's really loose. It's really fun. It goes all over the place. It's very fast. It's our own version of a long form format. If you ever talk to improv people, there's a billion different formats. Uh, and this yeah. is just kind of our thing. And yeah, uh, we're doing it tonight is a Wednesday. So we'll do a virtual show. We, we went virtual bi-weekly during the pandy. And now we'll go back hopefully in the uh, end of July. So Brian, I have to ask, how much harder is improv online? Like, is it just a totally different beast? It is. It's a completely different animal, mostly because you don't get the feedback, Jen. So when yeah. you're, when you're yeah. performing live, the feedback is immediate. And that is either yeah. in its uh, laughter and applause or in its silence. But either way, yeah. you get an immediate <laughs> feedback. In the virtual realm, it's a vacuum. You're just, you're putting yeah. stuff out there. There is the chat box, but I, I'm not uh, adept enough to split my focus and look mm -hmm. at the chat box mm -hmm. while I'm trying to play. So um, yeah. I usually, I'll glance at that after the fact, but it's, 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 it's a uh, interactive medium in so much as you have performers and an audience, but without any interaction that yeah, the performers yeah. can really, so it's very difficult. And honestly, it's not nearly as good as being alive and in person, but it is, um, I'm going to say it's better than uh, nothing. Absolutely. But it, does that mean you're just completely wasted and exhausted by the end? Cause you've just given everything out and got nothing back. Cause that's how I find online teaching. I put no, everything right. into it, but you just get nothing back because there's no, you know, you don't same have for, that fun. Same for and and, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's all analogous. It's, so it's, it's not quite so draining because we have the benefit of um, supposed comedy, you know, like we're, we're, we're yeah. lively and we're doing ridiculous things and, the novelty of the fictions that we create usually engender a lot of action in the chat box. So I'll see things popping yeah. up. So I know people yeah. are out there and I, I, <laughs> I assume they're enjoying it on some level. Um, and yeah. I'll read it after the fact and go, oh yes, okay, that, that, that's good. So it's not quite as draining as what you describe, but mm. I've, I've taught for the past year and trained uh, specifically virtually, only virtually. And again, I get the benefit of teaching and facilitating exercises that force people to experience it, stand up and do it and, you know, make an emotional choice and, and use their body. So I have the novelty of engaging my audience. Yep. Most people I'm yep. sure just turn off the camera and they listen to a lecture and you may get nothing back. And that's yeah. okay. Oh, no, look, me... I, I am exaggerating. We totally have students who interact and there's always conversations in the yeah. chat and we go into breakout rooms. So I am exaggerating, but I just find it more tiring. As an extrovert who yeah. loves interacting with the room, yeah. I just find it more tiring. But I mean, yeah, there's no way I'm just going to stand up and talk. That would be deathly for everyone, including well, me. It, it, I'm not going to do we're that. Not sure either, either side of that equation. We're not sure. Okay, let, let, me, um, let me guide things here a little bit. I want to hear some stories. <laughs> so, um, to try and cue Jeez, that. You're that's pushy, why I, Randy. That's me. That's my job, uh, being the, the enforcer. And to try and um, lay the groundwork for that, that's why I read that story from Vicki Miller, her whole deal about uh, taking improv 
uh, which you heard all that, Brian. What, what I that did, amazing, yeah. Awesome story. And the idea that she came back and found herself able to suddenly ask questions better at, at meetings and things like that. Um, you've been at this for 10 years now. We started 2010 or 11 or so. Uh, you've, you're now up to your neck working with scientists with JPL and the Ocean Sciences Meeting and on and on, all these different groups. Uh, have you got a few... Uh, little case studies for us. You don't have to mention any names or anything, but what what sorts of <laughs> feedback have you gotten from people that have done improv and reported back to you on how it's changed things for them? Yeah, well, first I'll say it's not it's not necessarily a life changer as your case study, uh, Vicky, Doctor Vicky, Vicky, somebody. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I do get very positive feedback, mostly in the the realm of uh, I also feel uh, able now to speak up. And, and that is a, that can be a life changer. I'm, I'm not saying this, but it is a big deal because if you don't speak up in your professional uh, circles, you're, you're less likely to have that attention as a positive differentiator. And you may be a wonderful uh, scientist or a wonderful uh, colleague or a great worker, but if you're not contributing to the hypotheses, the experiments to, to, to the, the, the general lab, whatever it is, you're seen as uh, less contributory, if that's, I can make up a word. So it's a very positive differentiator to have a little bit of that confidence to offer some. And the beauty that I get out of it improv wise is the, the, the actual experiments that you do in improv, the, it's all fictional. It's all disposable. The content doesn't matter. It's a donut shop. You know, it's a donut shop scene where Randy pukes. You know, who cares about the content? So you can take some of the pressure off of the information, which generally yeah. is the most important thing to all my scientists and, and my technologists. That, that that's what you live for is the the evidence, the data, the information, and it's got to be precise and it's got to be right. And it's got to be peer reviewed before you even offer to seek to. Well, in the improv stuff, you could just don't worry about the information, which allows you to practice all the mechanics of the soft skills, listening actively, connecting to your partner, speaking up, using your body, using your facial expressions, all that helps you communicate more clearly, which serves you as not only a scientist, but as a, as a person. So okay. So, but, but now tell us a, a case study of one individual of anybody that you've, you've seen any changes or heard back from them. Um, again, you don't have to mention any names. You mentioned, I won't, I won't because I can't remember the, the woman's name. I wish I could, but there was a doctor in L, at LSU. We, you mentioned that we talked to LSU uh, way back right. when. Yeah. And one of the doctors there had been given, I think she was a hydrologist. I may be wrong, but she had been giving uh, sort of the same talk for many years on her expertise or what it was. And she said it was fine, uh, but she wanted to try something new. She tried that. She fell into our workshop and she gave us email after the fact, about two weeks later, she said she had tried it with some of these uh, gesture, body language, facial expression, uh, put a little more intentional energy into how she presented. And she said it was the best it had ever gone in her whole career. So something like that is very encouraging and uh, to me and hopefully to other potential uh, students or scientists who might want to try this stuff. So yeah, mm -hmm. it can it can improve something that you've got. Okay. Down. All right. I'm, I'm going to take this in an, an unpleasant direction. Um, oh, great. Why? Why? <laughs> because that's my job with narrative. It's, it's about contradiction, agreement, contradiction, and consequence. I get it. Okay. We've agreed with you that, that improv can be wonderful. Yep. Now it's time for a little bit of contradiction. Right. Um, and I'll start with a little anecdote about maybe five or six years ago, my good friend, Holly Wartell did a workshop with a hundred publicists in Hollywood in which she had me refer both you and my cameraman, Paul, to work with her that day. And you remember that you guys did that did, whole day yeah. thing with her? Exactly. So these were publicists. These were people not from the science world, you know, from Hollywood um, communications people. And Paul was the cameraman. And I talked to him about a week later. And he said this little thing to me that I've quoted many times. Um, it, or no, actually, sorry, it was Holly who told me that Paul said this to her. At the end of the day, as he was wrapping his gear up, he said, uh, God, this was such a fun day doing this with all these Hollywood publicists. You know, they just have so much more energy and joy than the science people I normally have to work with when I do stuff with Randy. <laughs> um, and, you know, that kind of hit me hard, but it is kind of the truth. And now matching that story with a certain university, you may or may not remember this, but university where we did our workshop two rounds, one in the morning. We, we gave the presentation the night before, which everybody loved. There were about 200 people there. And then the next morning we had a three hour session with them and we split narrative and, and improv. You did improv one room, I did narrative. And that was all their communications people in the morning and they loved it. They ate it up. 
And then in the afternoon, they gave us a bunch of science graduate students, several of whom were PhD <laughs> students in biophysics. And some of them stood there in your improv thing with their arms folded and just quit and walked out of the room after a while. Um, and does that happen to you um, at the Groundlings Theater on Melrose Avenue? No, of course not. But it's a different, it's a different ecosystem completely. People come to Groundlings want to be involved in the theatrical comedy side of it. People that are getting their degree in biophysics probably have little to zero interest in the improv part of it. So we offer it, but you have you, you can't force someone to engage in that. Yeah. Um, there's that's, a lot that's, a very, that's a very good basic principle, all this communication stuff. That's what we've converged on as well with all of our story circles and uh, ABT framework stuff, which is nowadays we say uh, very much like Alcoholics Anonymous. We can't help you until you admit that you have a problem <laughs> that you can help for. And that's what you're talking about is those were graduate students thrown in there who just said, we don't have a problem. Why are we being forced to do this? If people don't opt in, it's hard. You taught me uh, fairly recently, Randy, that you know scientists generally don't like enthusiasm. And that's all I am. My DNA is just <laughs> enthusiasm. Uh, because the because of the, the spectrum of uh, you know emotion versus information, yes, and scientists yes. have to be focused on their information. I get it. Yeah. I don't have to worry about information. If I get something wrong, I'll say sorry, I was wrong. But no one dies from that. I don't lose it. You know, <laughs> entire species doesn't go uh, extinct because I got something wrong. Your world has that stakes to it. So it's a very different mindset. It's focusing on the information, rightly so, yeah. or and or focusing on the humans that you're interacting with. And the ideal, of course, is put them both together, you know, uh, but mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to do either, yeah. either of those aspects. So you, you got to work on both of them. No, you're absolutely right. And, and the critical side is essential. You can't do science if you're not critical about yeah. it. Um, but unfortunately, it comes with this side effect. And then that's the challenge is trying to make people aware of if you're not aware of that side effect, you're going to end up becoming very negative. And, and it, it just it's the enemy of communication, you know, just eviscerates communication. I call it the culture. But I think I, th you go, sorry, okay. I think there's a way around it though, because I think if you, you know, this is all about good comms, right? It's all about knowing your audience. If you know your audience are scientists and you know that evidence will appeal to them, you provide them with evidence to show that these things are going to be helpful for them and then they come on board. And, and I also think enthusiasm goes a long way because uh, Ryan, well, I'm absolutely okay, all right. The, all right, it's time for a little bit of debate here because- Sure, bring it on. Bring it on, here we go. You know, I, I gave the keynote address at the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biologists about seven or eight years ago. My buddy, Diana Padilla was there. We still laugh about that night. It was the most surreal audience I've ever uh, spoken to. A thousand hardcore integrative biologists. And they asked questions that were from a different planet. I mean, they, they <laughs> really, the classic one was I went through Joseph Campbell's thing about the ordinary world and the special world. Yeah. and. In the Q&A, a woman said, I'm kind of offended that you think that science is just ordinary and not special. And people around her were pointing to like, didn't she listen to your talk? You know, you, you gave this Joseph Campbell definition. It had nothing at all to do with calling science ordinary. But there were so many disconnected questions. And then when it was over with, um, people came up, a whole crowd you know, around me. I walked off the stage and they were asking me questions. And there was this one graduate student, I'll never forget him, he was Scottish with a thick accent. And he said, where's your data? Where's your data for all of this? You know, you're telling us this is how communications work. I don't see any proof, any evidence, no data. This is just a data-free presentation. And you can't do that. You know, If that's your criteria for how to communicate, which by the way, is exactly what the National Academy of Sciences is, is engaged in right now with their science of science communication, long-term 10-year project is let's put together a base of knowledge that's all data-based and you're not yeah. going to get there. You know, some of this stuff you have to, that's why we focus on intuition. That's your only long-term hope is you've got to have an intuitive feel for how to communicate. And if everything's going to be based on show me the data before I start to use this ABT thing, that, that comes up a lot. You know, where's your data? Can you show us before, after? Actually, <clears throat> it came up just last week. Um, one of the scientists from um, a major government agency that's introducing it there had written to me and said, have you got a good before after case of um, an abstract, you know, that's written in and, and, and form and then ABT form um, or even two side by side. And we've had that come up a lot and it's so hard because it's apples and oranges, other things change. And, yeah. you know, you can start, if you want to, then you take those two and start critiquing them. Well, look, this is not exactly the same thing here, blah, blah, blah. So we just don't even engage in that anymore. You know, all I could say is, Look at how many people have taken the course. Look at how booked it is. That's just the intuitive overarching thing. Clearly, it's working for people. But trying to break it down into this analytical stuff leads us right back to that cockamamie paper 
of the people making their own little yeah. science communication <laughs> course and then trying to assess whether it worked or not. So it's some. But I do think, I guess for me, Randy, I reckon if you go back to the basic and that is that all scientists are curious, I'm sure you would agree with me that scientists yeah, yeah. tend to be curious. I'll grant you that and much. I reckon, and, and maybe for me, I'm working with scientists who aren't quite as entrenched in the scientific culture yet because I'm working with students. So maybe that's part of the difference. But I find if I can... <clears throat> pique a scientist's interest by showing them some of the neuroscience research showing just how important narrative is and how little uh, success you're likely to have in convincing people of anything if you only rely on facts. And then if we get people to consider that to be good at narrative, you have to practice, then I can introduce all sorts of interesting things and get buy-in from my students. So different to improv, but with some similarities, I take students into an art gallery and make them practice their storytelling skills by interpreting artwork for one another, because there's no right or wrong. Exactly like you said, Brian, there's no right or wrong. Wait, wait, all right, slow that down. Now tell us the, exactly what you're talking about there. What do you do with them, with the art gallery? So we take students into an art gallery, give, put them in small groups, give them 20 minutes in, in pairs or threes to decide what they think the story of the artwork is. And the crucial thing is there is no right or wrong. So exactly what Brian said before, there is no way that they can make a mistake because it's their interpretation. And then they have to present that story to the rest of the class and tell the story in a convincing, you know, great presentation style, what this artwork is about. And it's just practicing narrative where there is no risk of them making a mistake. And it's really powerful. It's and they, they agree to do it. They agree to do it because they, they've bought my convincing evidence-based argument that they need to be good at narrative. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's awesome. I, I just wanted to hear the details. Of that Okay, Brian, what do you think? I'd like to offer off of that, Jen, that it's a safe-to-fail experiment. I just learned that phrase last exactly. year or two years ago, and, and that takes a lot of pressure off because, again, my science cohort, they, 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 they need to get everything right. They want to get everything right, and in your real world, there is a right and wrong. There's facts. Yeah. In the in the the art of soft skills, people skills, communication stuff, it's it's there's not a right or wrong way. So the improv exercises that what you just described, Jen, is just like an improv exercise. You know, it's yes. it's the, the the content doesn't really matter. You can't get it wrong. You have no idea what Caravaggio meant when he painted this guy. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. So whatever you say, <laughs> absolutely, just as valid and right as the other thing. But that allows yeah. you then to practice. The presentation skill, just to get a little exposure therapy of public speaking, you know, without mm -hmm. the pressure of also, you better get the molecular weight right. So it's like, oh shit, you know. So it's yeah. it's the practice of the skill set without the pressure of getting that content absolutely correct. That allows people to practice a little bit and get a little bit more comfortable with it. And if only you get two hours of extra public speaking skills in front of some other colleagues, that's a benefit. All of it is a benefit. Yeah. This is so funny. You know what I'm going to do later, like tomorrow or something? I'm going to take that little sequence that Jen just did where I, I cut her off there, and I'm going, to, I'm going to measure the words per minute rate there, and then I'm going to compare it to last week because I think Brian has gotten you amped up to talking really fast, much faster than you talked before. I've been trained so, her. I brought her along. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Improv, no, this man. is just... This is just my natural style, Randy, but you're just so cool as a cucumber that you don't normally bring it out on, in me. So oh, this, normally this is I bore the true you me. Slow way down <laughs> with my slow metabolism. Um, now, one of the hilarious <laughs> things that happened with my good friend, Brian, was in February, we had him teach. We did three concurrent sessions of the course in the month of February, and he taught one of them entirely on his own. And the first day that he came on, he talked about 2,000 words a minute. Oh, and, and instantly, I got text messages from two of our other instructors saying, this isn't going to work. And he's like, <laughs> and then at that evening, I, you know, we had a phone call. And I said, man, could you slow it down? He said, of course, I'm an actor. Just tell me what you want. And so then the next time he comes on, and the big thing I had him do was instead of standing up there and dancing around circles, sit down at a desk. And he comes on the next one. And in the first minute, I get text messages. And the two of them saying, this is awesome. This is perfect. And then I said later, you know, that was so great. And then again, he just said, this is what I do. I'm an actor. Tell me what you want. I've yeah. got it. That's what you get with really good actors when you're a director. It's incredible. You know, you when you go to film school and you work with these amateur actors, they're a disaster. I always used to say it's like driving a, car, a jalopy car with the steering wheels all loose and everything. You try and direct them and they're all over the place. And then eventually you get lucky enough to work with some real professional actors. And, and after a while, you, you get the best ones. And they're like a dial that you can move one little increment and you can see the change in them. They can direct them. So fine scale. And that's basically 
same thing with, with this guy. Um, that was amazing. Was I, I thank you for the compliment. I can take a note. That's what I tried to do. Yeah. But also, I was just nervous. I was teaching a bunch of hard scientists. I, I have a natural energy that's pretty big. When I present, I add a little bit more to that energy in hopes of engaging my audience so I don't you know, lose people or bore people or confuse people. So I had heightened it, Jen. I was, Randy's not teasing. I was like, hey, hey, let's go, scientists. <laughs> and I would have annoyed the crap out of myself had I been in that class. So yeah. thank God for the note. And then hopefully I took it. And then but I can, I can relate. I get super excited teaching. But for yeah. me, for me, the watershed moment was realizing how many of my students didn't have English as a first language and mm. how I had to be more inclusive and I had to train myself to slow down in order to allow everybody to participate fairly in the class. And that probably happened for me maybe 10 years ago. And since then, other than when I'm talking to Brian, clearly, <laughs> since then I've learned to be pretty measured just because it, it cuts people out of the conversation, which is not okay. Not at all. Uh, well, speaking of being inclusive, um, we have a question from someone in our massive audience today, uh, <laughs> someone named Julie, apparently has asked the question, um, are there any rules or structure that you follow when running a community of practice? This is really embarrassing because I did not allow Julie to be a part of the community of practice. And so this is a very pointed <laughs> question. Very bitter question. Uh, are there any rules? It's, it's the same sort of guidelines that I teach for, for any of our improv stuff that we do. The community of practice thus far, I usually give a lightning review. And, and as, if you think I'm fast now, I do a three minute review of all the theory of it. Use a little bit of emotion. You must listen to understand your partner, body language, all that stuff, lightning review. And then I just do exercises. I try to make most of them group exercises. So everyone that shows up gets more experience themselves. They get more stage time, so to speak. Uh, but we'll wrap it up usually with some paired exercises. So person A leads, leads this exercise. Person B has no idea what they're gonna say, but they must contribute to it. They must add to it. And the only way to do that successfully is to listen, to understand, to put the focus on the other person, to get out of your own head, focus less on the information than on your presentation. You know, all the stuff that we, we preach, that I preach, that's how we practice it in the, in the community of practice stuff. And uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's again, there's, there's very low stakes in this. It's very safe to fail. So I, I, I wish I had learned that phrase 10 years ago because I'd have been using it that long. People seem to connect to that too because it's kind of from the science world. So like, oh, okay, so this is an experiment. It's okay if we fail here because we'll learn. Yeah, right. You know, there's, there's, there's no stakes to the fiction at all. So we have about 10 more minutes. Um, Let's ask everybody in our audience to activate their cameras if they want to, starting with Marlis and Julie, if you want to. Uh, Marlis, come join us and ask your bitter, angry question. <laughs> <Brian. laughs> I'm afraid uh, Julie's not here. Marlis can't join us, so I will go ahead and ask a question oh, for Marlis. Great. Uh, so yeah, the improv teaches the yes and, uh, but the ABT emphasizes uh, the contradiction to engage your audience. Okay. So how do you square those two different forces? Excellent. You want me to go or you want to go? No, you, you, you I had the same question for you. I didn't oh, get around to it. Yeah. Uh, so in improv, if you're not familiar, yes, and is sort of the fundamental principle. It's the, the foundational guideline of improv. And it refers to no matter what my partner says, uh, donuts, blah, blah, blah. I've got to affirm that. I've got to accept that. Yes. By saying yes. And then contribute more by saying and, and then adding to it. So yes, and. It's not, however, a program. It's not an algorithm. It's, it's not literally saying the word yes to everything. It's a mindset of, I'm affirming that my partner just put out a piece of information. I, I'm going to agree with that and I'm gonna build upon it. So we're all about the yes. That is agreement. That is analogous to the A of the ABT. The, the and of the, of the ABT is you start with agreement and then you hit them with the contradiction of the but. So in improv, as you're spontaneously, spontaneously uh, creating collaboratively, right? You don't want to use a negation. You don't want to use the but there because it just stops people. It's the same sort of uh, uh, metaphor uh, if someone brings up the idea like, well, my theory is that birds fly because magic exists. Everybody's going to shout up and say, no, but it doesn't. There's evolutionary adaption to blah, 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 blah. But to an improvise, improviser or in the fiction, as soon as you say magic exists, it's like, yep, birds are magic. That's it. And they also build castles in the clouds, whatever. 
the ABT is not spontaneous. You should be, there's no, probably a way to apply it, but you're, you're crafting your narrative. You're thinking it through. You're using these, these skills and these tools to really try to make your data into the story by using that ABT as one of the many tools of the narrative stuff that Randy teaches. And that's the big difference there in the, the medium of being hey, spontaneous and improv and being prepared in your narrative. I, I got kind of a cool question. I, I, this is never- I'll be the judge of whether that question is- No, cool. no, you, I, I think you'll say that's a cool question once I ask this, it's never Let's quite see. dawned on me. Um, when you do improv, you know, you have guests like in the Joe show, you'll yeah. have special guests come to town and many of them often you've, you've never met before until sure. that night. Um, are there almost like different dialects of how people are taught yeah. improv? Do you end up getting, yeah. uh, see, that's approval. That's, that's <laughs> approval. My dog is, he just loves your question. Loves right? his questions. Yes, yes, been waiting for you to ask that question. Rah, rah, how do you uh, know, sorry, but how do you know the dog's not saying but? <laughs> but because shut up. I've, I've given that talk in prop classes for three years, Jen, and I, he knows okay. better than to say but. Okay, so it's like, you know, say somebody gets trained in improv in a different part of the country or something or a different set of rules. Do you find yourself some night where you can almost hear like this person speaking a different language of improv? Like, yeah, is that a cool question or what? It is a cool question. I, I, what you guys <laughs> oh, it tastes your way. <laughs> so cool that he's leaving. Exactly. It immediately made me think of Wales, Randy. You know how Wales come together with their different dialects and sure. they work out how to talk with one another? Sure. Uh, tell us about the dialects. Yeah. Yes, improvisers are exactly like whales. I agree with your premise. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Brownlings is one of many improv theaters in town. In LA, we're probably the biggest one. And we have a focus on character work, big comedic characters. In the intro, you mentioned Will Ferrell, Kristen Wiig, Pee Wee Herman, Phil Hartman. They're all big character people, plus uh, Melissa McCarthy, uh, Maya Rudolph, Lisa Kudrow. They're all Groundlings alumni and they're known for comedic character work, right? Second City, who I'm a huge fan of. Uh, they're out of Chicago originally, but they're all they're international. Um, Second City is a little less focused on, on character as I understand their training. I've not gone through it. Um, so they will be a little uh, wittier, a little, a little more uh, into the clever dialogue aspect of it. So you can see a difference when you're playing with, with groundlings, people go immediately to big character. When you're playing with other uh, trainer, uh, people who've been trained in a different way, they may go more about what they're talking about, the actual talk part of it. Um, UCB, which is Upright Citizens Brigade, I'm a huge fan of theirs. They've got something called uh, find, the, find the Game of the Scene, I believe is what it is. And their theory is whatever, whatever the first weird thing that happens in the scene, like the, the regurgitating donuts, I'm so sad that came up, Jen. Uh, then you repeat that. You, you yes and that, and then you're, regurgit you're regurgitating the coffee. And okay, the so um, then which program are you not a fan of that you think really sucks? The Herald. It's not a, it's not a program, oh. it's a format. So yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody yeah, yeah. teaches, or a lot of people, a lot of theaters teach the Herald. The way I learned it years ago, it is so regimented and it's yeah. so you're forced to right. go in this style and you must move this, the scenes forward in this way. And you must come back to the, or the sequence of ABC. I find that so uh, constraining yeah. that I don't like it. I don't like to teach it. Uh, I think it's hard for students to get into improv if you're trying to force them into that format first. Right. I'd rather let them give, give them free range first and then they can choose that. that that's an opt-in thing. So yeah. I don't, I don't like the Herald. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that something that people boast about, you know, somebody did a two hour Herald or something like that that went oh. on and on, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, what if it's, what if it's, you know, an hour and 59 of it is crap, you know, yeah, or I mean, no, it's just exactly. not engaging right. or, you know, here's, here's a little tidbit to share with you. Um, actually, you know, on, on, um, Sunday for next week's episode, I'm going to have an hour long discussion with my two film school buddies, Jason, Jason and, yeah. Yeah, and, and Greg Tillman. Um, so here's the, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you, but it, you know, it's kind of, gossipy a little bit um in film school at usc in the mid 90s you know long before there was people were making videos and all that before there was youtube um there were all these little like you could almost call memes that went around like you know this is the basic rule I mean, one of the one of the ones was um voiceover is the crutch of the failed filmmaker that yeah, was I like you were programmed with that <laughs> and that's just not true you know look at goodfellas the whole movie's voiceover it's it's brilliant but you got these fundamental rules that that you'd hear people regurgitating them even though they didn't even really understand what that was based on it wasn't their own logic and one of those was that you you can't uh, don't cast the groundlings they're too big you know their characters are too large and <laughs> i heard that i got to watch that over the course of 20 years 
change. And I, one of the moments of change for me was probably about, oh, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, one night when I, and Jason Enzler, my good buddy, you know, I lived next door to an apartment building for a couple of years. Um, and he propagated that thing. He said, man, I'm never going to, he was casting a lot of TV shows and things like Pretty that, but then or man. directing TV shows. And finally, one night I dragged him, dragged him kind of reluctantly with two other film school classmates to a groundling show. And everybody just killed it that night. And Melissa McCarthy, I don't know if you remember the skit that she did. It was the uh, aerobics class and her character's name was Mick Rib. That's what I remember. And it was, it was the funniest night ever. And, you know, I kept looking over my three buddies there and they were just crying. They were laughing so hard. And after that, Jason started casting groundlings in, you know, it all changed. And it all started to change as they were making videos and YouTube came along. I think people began to see that the groundlings weren't too large to use in film, but there really was that meme back then in the mid nineties. I get it. I used to fight that um, at the beginning of my acting career. Sometimes you'd get called in for uh, suddenly Susan or whatever the sitcom was back in the day. And uh, sometimes they needed a guest star to come in and bring that higher energy, the almost clownish energy. And sometimes you were just a, more of a straight man, you know, but it's very individualized. You know, not, you cannot say that every marine biologist is blank. You cannot say that every groundlings actor is blank, yeah. you know, so everybody mm -hmm. is situational. It depends on the, the, the material, depends on the director you're working with. It depends on the individual actor, the style of what, the, the show. What was that one? What was that one short film you did years ago? <laughs> it's probably erased from the internet, but what is it? I think you're in for a job interview and you slap the coffee mug out of somebody's <laughs> hand. <laughs> that was a sketch me and Cashman. Uh, uh, Jim Cashman and I did a sketch called Killer Instinct. And it was a, a sketch we did live in the show, but we, we, we recorded it uh, before YouTube just to be, have a short film kind of thing. Yeah. And it was basically a very inappropriate office. <laughs> it was freaking hilarious. Right. And, yes. violence. It was you don't violence. want to tell about how it scaled up, but it just kept ratcheting up more and oh, more violence. Yeah. Yes. By, by the end, I think <clears throat> I scalded someone and then it ended with murder. So it always yes. ended with comedic <laughs> murder, everybody. Yay. <laughs> I need to. I need to find this. Is is this? Does this gold still exist somewhere? I tried to find it. I couldn't. Yeah, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Killer Instinct is the name of that short film, and uh, okay. go in with an open mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some of our opinions is your finest work ever. <laughs> it's hilarious. I mean, <laughs> subjective too. So uh, that goes back to the growlings being too big as actors. Is like you know you can't believe any of it. that's anecdotal randy don't give me your anecdotal bullshit and tell me that it's data it's not it's anecdotal. <laughs> yeah we need we need evidence randy where are the numbers come on don't be such scientists she's <laughs> fun here honest to goodness um and speaking of fun we could go on for another two hours but we're that, that just blew by we're out of our hour i'm sorry jen we were having such a good time uh but that's what happens you bring in a guy who talks really fast at the time blows by <laughs> But that oh, that's okay awesome. though, because if you if you add up every word that was said in this hour, that it'll be way better bang for your buck than any other week when you and I have just talked at a normal right. speed. So <laughs> this is excellent. It's a good way to look Very at true. it, man. Good yes and. Yeah. Two hours for the price of one, precisely. Exactly. Um, exactly. Very cool. What's what's next on your schedule, Brian? You got um um got some shows coming up. You got any uh, science? Shows. I'm doing the show tonight, uh, and then I'll continue whatever the Uncle Joe show shows and, until we go live again. I'm teaching at Brookhaven National Labs, uh, doing something for those guys. It's a, a, another big sort of feather in my cap because I'm very very proud about that. Um, yeah, so, uh, several little coordinating gigs, tra training gigs, facilitating gigs, and several comedy gigs. So all over the map. Nice. Um, what about this thing? Are you bitter that you did this, or do you do you still get any mileage? No, out of it? I, I, bitter is not. I have I have many feelings about it, Randy. As I lay, lay awake every night for hours. Wish he had no, no, I'm not bitter at all about it. I do re have regrets that I I didn't write it now that I've had an additional nine years of of working on this stuff. I think my yeah. material is a whole lot more evolved and a lot more matured than what it is what I wrote back then. But no, not not bitter in any way. I love that book. Yeah, yeah, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. So that was our book, The Connection Book, um, which just means you got to write your own separate book sometime very, very soon. Ugh, he's always on me to write a book. All right, I'll write, it, I'll write a book. <laughs> write it's going to be fiction. I don't know what I'm going to write, but I'll write something for you. 
Just make well, it. Well, clearly fun. it's going to be about regurgitating donuts. We've got clearly. the plot for you. <laughs> right? It writes itself too, Jan. It's just, it's perfect. Easy. Ryan's donut shop. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for all the stuff you've done in the course. And um, I think we're done with you for the summer. We won't be knocking on your door until August when we, uh, we're going to be taking June and July off with the course. Everybody mm. go away and get recharged. And then August 3rd, we'll be coming back starting round 15, which is going to be split between, uh, let's see, the Five Gyres Ocean Plastics Group and the U.S. Forestry Service. Forest Fantastic. Service. Fantastic. Yes. Yes. I've been told this, it's Forest Service, not Forestry Service. I'm trying uh, to forest. Get okay. Very good. Cool. Uh, all right, Jen, have fun with your expedition next week. Uh, I will see I will. you. Will thank you. I'll see yes. you in two weeks. We will miss you on Sunday when I have my discussion with my two buddies. But then we'll look forward to you coming back in two weeks. So, excellent. Everybody, great to meet you, Brian. Bye.